Thank you. All right, so let's get started. So I'm going to be talking about standards and safety. And you know, I think that the micromobility industry has potentially even graduated our infancy period. And now maybe teenagers are well into our developmental years. And these are the years when the industries really start to have a better sense of identity and understanding of where it fits into the broader mobility ecosystem. Um, I would say that it's also a very ripe time for pre-competitive collaboration. So let's talk about that. What are we doing for standards and safety for pre-competitive collaboration? So as um, I was introduced, I am Annie. I run our um, shared mobility and micromobility standards at SAE. Um, I also have a nighttime job, which is um, being a PhD student in micromobility. Um, so essentially, I think about micromobility probably 20 hours in a day. So let's start with some of the bumps that the industry has experienced. Um, we see that um, emergency room visits have spiked with scooter riders. We've seen a very heated debate around data sharing. We have seen scooters toppled on sidewalks, blocking access. And lastly, but not least, uh, we have seen cities um, issuing cease and desist orders. So what does that mean? And it all begs these questions of, you know, what is micromobility? Um, how can we ensure the safety of the riders and those who are using and sharing the road with the riders? And how can we regulate them? And how can we all work together in doing so? So let's start with what on earth is micromobility? So it starts with this macro level confusion. Um, and I want to illustrate this with what we had pre micro boom. We had the non-motorized transport, we had the pedestrians and cyclists literally given sliver of the road space called a sidewalk and bike lane. And then we, on the other end, we have the motorized transport with conventional motor vehicles. We have the cars, trucks, buses, and they were generously allocated the drive lane. And in between, and after some of you know, electrification of this and that, and um, glorified pogo sticks and whatnot, we have something called micromobility. And the question really becomes, where are these boundaries? And how do we draw them? And where are you supposed to ride these things? So let standards take care of that. So essentially, a standard is an agreed upon way of doing things. Let's imagine a world where powered sockets and outlets, like the power plugs and outlets, were not standardized. I mean, I honestly already live a dongle life through, you know, courtesy of my, Mac, my uh, MacBook, so that would be an absolute nightmare to haul around um, a suitcase filled with adapters. So standards have really infiltrated into our everyday lives without us even realizing. And a recent example of that in the uh, mobility space is the levels of automation. So SAE published our J3016, and now when an OEM says, hey, I'm making an autonomous vehicle, you can actually know what part of that is automated, to what extent, and what part of it is still requiring the uh, human to perform the driving task. So, with the same logic, um, we started the Powered Micromobility Vehicles Committee. We started this at the end of last year, and I am proud to say that it, we are not going in a glacial pace as um, standards are often recognized as doing so. So it essentially brings together a community of operators, regulators, manufacturers, and researchers to build consensus around micromobility. So we have been working on this very first document. And when we work on a, a new topic in standards, it's always the case that we start with a glossary. Let's set the common language. And we have done that through J3194. It's a taxonomy and a classifications document. It is currently in ballot, um, anticipated to be published in November. Um, essentially, we have put very large thresholds and classifiers within. So 
Speed and curb weight, um, we're looking at 30 miles per hour and 500 pounds in curb weight, so it excludes the, the human and the material load. And you may think, oh, that's really large. And it is, because we have um, classifications within this. We also introduced six different types of power micromobility vehicles. So we have divided the scooters into two types, whether it has a seat or not. And the difference between a powered seated scooter and a powered bicycle is that a bicycle has operable pedals that the rider can you know, pedal to propel forward and um, add human power to it. We have divided the boards into two categories, whether it has a self-balancing mechanism or not. Now, let's talk about sticky issue number two, data. And this has become an extremely heated topic, um, political and sensitive. And we see this as a topic that um, requires some serious level of collaboration across sectors. So the data that we're talking about is the data that is generated um, by the new mobility services, right? So we are very excited to um, get started on the Mobility Data Collaborative. It is a multi-sector forum where public and private partners will really gather, convene to advance and accelerate the dialogue around data sharing. We, this is a sample of our current partners. Um, as you can see, we have many of the major operators, and we have regulators, we have data platform, as well as academic institutes. And the goal really here is to find solutions to leverage the value and un unlock the value of data and do it securely and effectively. So we have decided on our first two projects, the first one being around performance metrics. So the problem is that since day one of scooter operations or even bike share operations, um, it has never been clear on how you actually measure the impact. There are different metrics and different uh, definitions for even uh, the same metric, right? Like we're looking at 15 different ways of actually getting the value for how many rides per vehicle per day. Really ridiculous situation. So we are proposing to create a glossary of terms as well as uh, methodologies to address this very issue so that Finally, we're able to compare apples to apples across operators, across data platforms, and across jurisdictions. The second project is around data privacy, and it really tackles the contracts piece. So right now, we have all these one-off, custom-built contracts um, being uh, established between operators and cities. Essentially, it is an ex... ex uh, it is a resource-intensive process um, on both ends, and um, it needs to be streamlined. And often, they don't adequately address the data privacy concerns. So what we're proposing is to standardize legal language for data governance models, uh, several of them. So at the end of the day, cities and operators can pick and choose what would be the most preferable model for them and then go with it and we can streamline the entire data sharing agreement process. Now, let's talk about safety. And this is probably a very sticky issue for all of us. Um, and um, it is one that I'm gonna have to put my nerd hat on instead of my SAE hat. Um, so let's talk about how we've been evaluating safety in the last several decades. Essentially, road safety has been defined as the absence of crashes. The universal metric has always been historical crash data. There are several shortcomings of only looking at crash data, and that includes the fact that crashes are actually very rare and very random, statistically speaking. Therefore, they require extremely long observation periods. We're looking at three to five years as a general rule of thumb, and this is exacerbated in micromobility just because there are not as many trips, right, or vehicle miles traveled. And crashes are extremely underreported. This is especially true when it comes to cyclists, so we can infer the same for other micromobility users. And lastly, because crash reports are done 
after the fact, they really lack the details around the failure mechanism. So when we look at the auto story here, we see that it took decades for the U.S. to understand that there is a road safety problem, understand what the actual issues are, and then put the countermeasures in place and those to take effect, right? So my question for you is, do we really want to take the same route for micromobility? Can we really afford that? So what I propose is um, something that you know, probably a handful of researchers have been looking into, and it's surrogate safety. So if you look at this pyramid, at the very tip, you see the crashes. That's the data, the very limited data that we've been looking at all this time. So why not look at something that resembles crashes statistically and logically? So let's look at serious conflicts. They are objective and reliable indicators that should be um, occurring more frequently than crashes, right? So essentially, you're going to save that three to five year observation period. And the reason why surrogate safety was so unpopular after it kind of had its heyday um, in the 80s is because it required you know, to dispatch human observers in the middle of intersections, and it was extremely resource intensive. But now, the story is different with technology. We are able to collect video data in a very inexpensive manner. We are able to automate the road user classification. Right now, I'm actually um, training my machine to learn what a scooter looks like. It just thinks that it's a funny pedestrian. Um, and we can also track the objects along the way. So here is a video of DC. And um, this is a road with a bike lane going one way. And there's two-way traffic. Oh, sorry about that. Can we? All right, so you can see that there is a red light violation here, and this is an extremely frequent um, occurrence. There's a scooter going the wrong way in preference of the bike lane. We see the cyclist turning left and having to cross over the vehicle. And we see scooters making extremely awkward left turns. And now they are on the shoulder of the road, then they now are doing a red light violation to make the end of this trip. The, um, we also see skateboarders doing red light violation. And you have to understand that this is you know, not that many hours of video, and I was able to pick these out. So this one is a very serious conflict that you're going to observe. So here's a cyclist, red light violation, ouch. And we're going to watch this again with the um, trajectories, with machine learning object um, tracking. It was 1.43 seconds away from being a crash. We're this is a different dude, not the same guy. Same scenario, though. Yeah. And then again, with object tracking, it was 1.17 seconds away from being a crash. So. I would like to challenge us to think, rethink road safety. Um, you know, the 737, the Boeing 737 MAX 8, two of them went down. It had a lot of media coverage. And frankly, we have 18.5 fully loaded Boeing 737 MAX 8s going down every single day worth of crashes and fatalities. So is it really that we have, as a society, accepted that crashes is a norm and it is simply an unlucky event? Um, I think as the micromobility community wants to grow, um, it is inevitable that if we don't do anything, as the tr vehicle miles traveled grows with micromobility, so will the crashes, so will the, tra uh, the fatalities. So let's change the narrative and let us look at the road safety issue prior to crashes accumulating to do anything about them. Thank you.